and it seems to be dropping all the time. Are you on now? Yeah. I connect and then it just drops. Hello? Yeah, yeah, if you can hear you at times, your screen just, uh, but your screen is there, your, uh, your uh, video goes off, don't worry about that, at times your video goes off, your screen is there and your uh, voice is also coming. गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी नमस्कार एक बार फिर आप सबका स्वागत है आज की इस पाँच बजे की स्पोर्ट्स साइंस क्लास में जो हम अपने कोच डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम के अंतर्गत कर रहे हैं वी आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस क्लास ऑन स्पोर्ट्स साइंस ट्रेनिंग फॉर परफॉर्मेंस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट एंड Training doesn't mean that we just. So I can't hear anything at the moment. Uh, I can hear you very well. Can't you hear me? Uh, Gurpreet, are you there? Yes, sir. You're audible. You're audible. Okay. Uh, when I can hear you. Ah, okay. There we go. Now I can hear you. So I was saying that training for performance. बहुत ही इम्पॉर्टेंट चीज़ है और सिर्फ बहुत सारी एक्सरसाइज करना एंड प्रेस्क्राइबिंग अ लॉट ऑफ एक्सरसाइज इज नॉट व्हाट विल गारंटी परफॉर्मेंस सो आज हमारे लिए हमारे पास मिस्टर वेन लॉम्बर्ड हैं जो भारतीय महिला हॉकी टीम के स्ट्रेंथ एंड कंडीशनिंग एक्सपर्ट हैं कोच हैं वो हमारे साथ बात करेंगे इस बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट मुद्दे पर कि एथलीट का प्रोफाइल जानना जरूरी है उसको क्रिएट करना जरूरी है एक्सरसाइज प्रिस्क्रिप्शन के लिए फिर स्ट्रेंथ की क्या प्रिस्क्रिप्शन होनी चाहिए फॉर परफॉर्मेंस और कंडीशनिंग की क्या परफॉर्मेंस प्रिस्क्रिप्शन होनी चाहिए उसके बाद वो इसको मॉनिटर कैसे करना चाहिए इसके बारे में भी वो हमें हमसे बात करेंगे uh, मिस्टर लॉम्बर्ट इसके पहले इसके पहले 2016-17 में इंस्पायर इंस्टीट्यूट में भी से भी जुड़े हुए थे और उससे पहले उन्होंने बहुत सारे बहुत साल साउथ अफ्रीका में काम किया है और बहुत सारे स्पोर्ट्स में उन्होंने काम किया है उन्होंने बहुत सारी डिग्रीज हासिल की हुई हैं ही ही हैज गॉट डिग्रीज इन बायो काइनेटिक्स इन स्ट्रेंथ एक्सरसाइज and also he is doing his phd in uh, in exercise science so in se acha we cannot get a better uh, person who can tell us about training for performance now without wasting much time i will hand over to mr lombard his presentation will mostly be in english 
बट बीच बीच में मैं कोशिश करूंगा कि मैं कुछ इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स हिंदी में बता सकूं जब वो अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन को रोकेंगे तब मिस्टर वेन आई जस्ट टोल देम दैट आई विल स्टॉप यू विल स्टॉप मी यू विल स्टॉप इन बिटवीन सो दैट इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट कैन बी टोल्ड इन हिंदी थैंक यू ओवर टू यू Thank you sir thank you for the introduction um hello everyone so yeah thank you for having me it's a privilege for me to be here and just sharing some of my ideas with you um so like um sir said is that the presentation is title is training for performance and uh, can you see my screen at the moment okay cool um so the presentation title is training for performance um uh, beyond the brainless model of exercise prescription and you'll get a better idea of why i've called it that um as we go through the presentation because i know on saturday you had a physiology lecture and i spoke a lot about how the brain affects movements and the brain affects um adaptations to strength training and so on and so forth and that's a really important model because i feel a lot of times we forget about that model and we just think about the sets and reps and the muscles getting bigger and so on and so forth but it's actually the brain that controls every adaptation and if we're not taking that into account it becomes a problem but as we go through it um through the presentation hopefully that becomes a little bit clearer and you'll understand what I what I mean by beyond the brainless model the other thing you can see on the olympic rings you say uh, the motto sites altius fortius with is faster higher stronger and as coaches as support staff physiologists that's what we our ultimate game our ultimate goal is we want to get our athletes faster we want them to be able to jump higher we want them to be able to uh, be bigger faster stronger and so on and so forth so i want to give you some tools that you can use to hopefully achieve these goals and these are going to be models that i've used over the last 10 or 12 years or so of doing this job um on how i go about um working with elite level athletes um if there are anyone that are in the audience that are working with um young athletes some of these principles are a little bit more difficult to apply with younger athletes but we can give you some ideas around that as well oh yeah so i know there's been a bit of introduction on my background i know not everyone knows me so i'll just give you a small um idea of where i've come from or my studies that i have done over the past so in 2004 2005 i did a diploma in sports management during that time i was in a as an aspiring cricketer and I wanted to become a professional cricketer during that time and in South Africa the way it works is you have to get a degree while you are trying to become a professional sportsman which worked quite well for me because while doing cricket um I was introduced to the trainers there and I started creating love for exercise science and so on and so forth so after a failed attempt I only ended up playing about five first class games and I decided okay look I'm going to have to call it a day with cricket I decided to take the studies a little bit further so between 2006 2009 did a bachelor in sports science and that led me to do an honors in biomechanics so those who are not too sure what biomechanics is in South Africa we got a degree that um is called biomechanics and basically it's really focused on orthopedic rehab and we do a lot of work in the rehab side of things and then also elite performance based stuff and then eventually after that you have to do a one year internship to learn a little bit more about the field and get experience from people who know more about it than you do um so i spent uh, got lucky and i got an internship at the sports science institute of south africa at the high performance center there and then yeah so i spent about 6 years at the high performance center while i was there i did my masters and um, nothing about what place like the sports science institute of south africa is you get exposed to wide variety of sports so there isn't a national team so i feel that I probably haven't worked with so from from cricket to hockey to rugby to um you'll see in some of the videos wheelchair basketball to wheelchair uh, to para athletics to athletics normal athletics you go for swimming you name it we've worked with them so it gives me a really nice background and hopefully i can make this up made this presentation relative to everyone that is um watching and not just so i hope you don't worry that's not just going to be hockey based but it's going to i've tried to make it relative to everyone as much as possible and as so said at this time i have i uh, am still trying to finish my phd but i've been traveling a lot for the last 6 years um in that time i've also been working i worked in china for a year um i was head of athletic performance there working with um, a hockey team and then also like so mentioned i was at iss head of strength and conditioning for a year before joining the women's hockey team 
So yeah, that's the summary of what I've been up to. And yeah, let's get straight into it and go and discover more about how to improve performance in elite athletes. Okay, so the first step I want to, uh, want to look at is building a robust athlete. And that's my whole principle and my whole background that I work towards. And I feel that my job is to create an athlete that can go to the, that coaches can take and know whatever they throw at that athlete on the pitch, on the athletics field, whatever it is, that they are robust enough to handle the demands that the coach throws at them. So that we get that resilience. And we know that with an increase in resilience and increase in robustness, their chance of injury is less. So that is important for me. So it's not just about strength conditioning and about improving performance, but I want to try and reduce their relative risk of injury as well. So if we look at what is a robust athlete, and a simple definition is a healthy, powerful, vigorous athlete that is resilient to the demands placed on them. And that's so important, that last bit, but the resilient to the demands placed on them is probably the most important thing because I need to know that if someone has um, athletics world champs coming up, Olympics coming up, that they can cope with the demands and the pressure at that both events and try and um, perform at their best. So that is so important for us because we need to know, know that if the athlete has to perform multiple events over time, they can actually go about um, withstanding those demands. And there's different ways we can go about doing this. And I'm going to give you a background on how I've gone about it. And one of the most important things for me is creating an athlete profile. And what I mean by that is we need to understand what are the demands that sport has on that athlete. What, is that, what are the individual strengths and weaknesses of that athlete from a physiological standpoint that makes him as good or her as good or not as good as they can be in their event? Then part of that becomes your uh, risk screening for injuries, like I've said. The strength and conditioning, what type of strength and conditioning strategies we can implement with elite level athletes. Um, with that is that injury reduction, like we just said. And then different monitoring strategies. How do we go about monitoring these athletes over time to ensure that whatever um, program we're doing with them is actually fitting what they need? So one thing, I just if you see before we zoom in there, you see that top there, it says start with the end in mind. And that's a really important concept because we need to know what type of athlete do we want to produce in our programs to perform at their best in a year, two years, three years, four years time. So I'll give you an example of hockey, for example. I know hockey is a high intensity, intermittent um, sport. So I know they need to have really high demands, um, high ability to produce repeated sprint efforts, but they also need a very good aerobic capacity. They also need to be very agile. They also need to be strong. And all these things take in, take, have to be taken into account when I design the program for my athletes. So that's what I mean by starting with the end in mind. How do I go about understanding what is required in my sport and what is where is that individual? So the sports demands are here. Where does that individual fit within those demands? And what do I need to work on to help them um, achieve those demands? So one thing I think that needs to change in general sports um, performance is a paradigm shift is needed that the current mindset is set that we want to perform now and that's the only thing we focus on. However, as you all know, is in a cycle or a macro cycle, meso cycle, there might be four, five, six, seven events that you need to peak for. So if you're only focusing on what is important at the next event and not considering how now might comes along to run. It can create problems for your athletes when they need to peak multiple times within a training cycle. So that's something we need to bear in mind. So we need to have a training that is designed where that's not only designed for the short term competitive performance. We need to think long term and how everything affects um, everything along the way. So I stop you here. Yeah, please. Okay, dosto. Uh, uh, वेन uh, ने सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट चीज हमको ये बताई कि uh, आपको क्या क्या पाना है एथलीट्स के एथलीट को रोबस्ट होना चाहिए उसने ये बताया कि हाउ डू वी बिल्ड अ रोबस्ट एथलीट एथलीट को एरोबिक होना चाहिए एजिलिटी होनी चाहिए और स्ट्रांग होना चाहिए फिर उसने ये बताया कि हमको एंड क्या है हमको क्या पाना है अपने एथलीट से वो बड़ा क्लियर होना चाहिए एक साल में दो साल में तीन साल में चार साल में हमारा 
गोल क्या है फाइनल ये एकदम क्लियर होना चाहिए वो कहते हैं कि हमारे यहाँ अभी जो करेंट माइंडसेट है वो स्पोर्ट्स परफॉर्मेंस की तरफ ज्यादा है कि मेरे को अभी अगले टूर्नामेंट में अपने एथलीट के साथ क्या चाहिए ये लेकिन बहुत जरूरी नहीं है क्योंकि आपकी एक मैक्रो साइकिल में या एक मीजो साइकिल में हो सकता है कई सारे इवेंट्स हों तो आपको हर इवेंट्स के लिए ट्रेनिंग डिजाइन करनी पड़ेगी और उसी हिसाब से ट्रेनिंग करनी पड़ेगी आपको एक छोटे शॉर्ट टर्म गोल के लिए ही तैयार नहीं करना है आपको लॉन्ग टर्म परस्पेक्टिव भी ध्यान में रखना है ये बता रहे हैं ये बहुत जरूरी है कि गोल होना चाहिए और लॉन्ग टर्म गोल होना चाहिए थैंक यू सॉरी yeah you are oh, good thank you so what is the mission our mission is to find what is effective what is what is ineffective and one thing we know now a lot of the research has showed us is that focusing on the now although it might facilitate performance in the early years might be detrimental to optimal development of an athlete and compromise their future performance and that's what we just said is that if we're only focusing on what we can do now we might um compromise what they need to achieve later on but also if we do too much too quickly and um, we start burning our athletes out and they also possible possibly got a higher risk of overuse injuries i quite like um to use the terminology of almost like if you're cooking a meal so when you're cooking a soup if you got it on very very hot too quickly you burn that soup so with athletes is the same principle we want to slow cook our athletes to ensure that they build a nice big chronic load over time and they can peak at the right time without um burning out and getting a uh, risk of high, uh, overuse injuries and then there's the efficient approach is what we just mentioned is that the aim of athletic training should be to enable um individual athletes to tolerate loads which we spoke a lot about now and maximize their technical and tactical coaching so that's really important and anyone that's in exercise science exercise physiology strength and conditioning no matter what it might be is that our ultimate aim is to make our athletes better at their sport if they not if we seeing what we do is not making them better at their sport we probably have to look at a little bit differently and say okay we probably have to adjust a little bit what we're doing because they're not performing on the pitch or on the track or wherever it might be or in the pool for example and so we need to look a little bit differently at what we're doing so we also have to remember it's a process and we can't just expect our athletes to go from point a to point x as quickly as possible so like i said we want to slow cook our athletes and this was also shown in some research where they showed that it's evident that in many and most youth athletes they lack basic physical fitness and athleticism so starting at a very physic uh, low physical fitness puts them at a disadvantage so what we need to do is come up with ways to slow cook our athletes even young athletes we want to slow cook them it's even more important for the younger they are so that we progress as slow a little bit slower than the elite level athletes to ensure that they get the fundamental movement and the fundamental strength and the base of physical fitness um right before we implement all these um high in high end strength conditioning things that I'll show you later on and just to make a point you you guys will know these athletes is even with these guys these are at the top of their game we still went back and worked on the basics when I first met them so you got Tadesh and you got Niraj and you got Ganesh um and we still needed to go back to the basics to make sure that I was happy enough when I first met them that they are in a good enough um physical capacity to move on and obviously with Vinesh she just came off an injury so we had to move a little bit slower and this was a return to play after Rio and um so it was a really bad injury that she had there but the point being is that every athlete has to have a process and making sure you know what that process is so you starting with that in mind you know where they want to to get them to and then working backwards from there and planning how to get there is important so if we move on to the next part and this is quite important for me so i think with athletes sometimes we forget they also just human beings they people with feelings and emotions and all those sort of things and we just treat them that they must train day in and day out and we don't really get to know our athletes um really well and this is something that i found over the years has helped me a lot is if i understand the athlete as an individual and understand what makes them i call it the what makes them tick i can get the most out of them so there's a really good book by a company called exos known as every day is game day which is that book over there and what they look at is they say you need to know what your athlete's why is what is it that drives them what is it that gets them up every day to perform at their best and if you can identify that why 
it starts helping you get them better and better. So their why, or we also call it the it, is the athlete's purpose. So what is it that makes them hungry every day to perform better? You need to understand your athlete's why or your it, and then understand your athlete's why will help you design the athlete performance game plan. So we know, we know, okay, we say, for example, athlete X, he absolutely loves the sport. He does it for the passion of everything. So we can work everything backwards and say, okay, what can we do to help him um, nurture that passion for the sport? And then you can prepare for it, train for it, feel for it, and rest for it. And those are important concepts. And I think that's been covered in the last couple of weeks as well. The importance of nutrition, the importance of recovery, the importance of training, and all those sort of things. And you can't forget that those are all part of the puzzle. And forgetting one of those aspects does not help your athletes in the long run. So your athletes' why should be a statement of who they are and where they want to be. So again, starting with the end in mind, you can chat to your athletes and you can ask them, what is your ultimate goal? Where do you want to go in one year, two years, three years, four years' time? And then you can help them um, build a game plan working backwards and saying, this is how we think we can achieve it. But my biggest advice is always have the athletes buy into that game plan because if they're not buying into it, it's very difficult to get them to perform at their best. Uh, so There's I'll stop you yep. here. One minute. Yeah, please. I'll just yeah, stop please. You here. Can you go to the last line? It's a very yep. important one. So I'll say it in a Hindi quickly. It's very important to understand that your athlete is an individual. वो भी हमारी तरह ही एक मतलब लड़का है या लड़की है और उसमें भी वो भी एक इंडिविजुअल है तो उसको उसको जानने की आपको बहुत सख्त जरूरत है हर कोच को ये पता होना चाहिए कि उसका एथलीट क्या है उसका क्या पर्पस है क्यों वो कर रहा करना चाहता है ये सबसे पहले कि वो क्यों ये करना चाहता है उसके बाद उसके साथ मिलके उसका परफॉर्मेंस गेम प्लान क्या प्लान होना चाहिए अगले क्या चाहता है वो दो तीन साल में वो हमने पहले बताया तो उसके साथ मिल करके उसका प्लान बनाना चाहिए और उसके लिए एक बार उसका प्लान बनाया उसके साथ फिर बनाया उसके बाद उसी को ट्रेनिंग करना चाहिए उसी के लिए सब कुछ करना चाहिए उसके लिए न्यूट्रिशन क्या करना है उसके लिए एक्सरसाइज क्या प्लान करनी है उसके लिए कॉम्पिटिशन क्या प्लान करने हैं तो ये बहुत जरूरी है कि आपके एथलीट्स जो जो उनको चाहिए उसके बारे में आपसे डिस्कस करें और फिर वो प्लान बनाएं बहुत अच्छे एथलीट्स का प्लान हमेशा एथलीट्स के साथ ही बनता है एथलीट का हमेशा उसमें बायेन होना चाहिए और तभी आपको मालूम पड़ेगा कि सही प्लान क्या है और आप कोच में और एथलीट म दोनों एक ही प्लेटफॉर्म पे रहेंगे। या। परफेक्ट, थैंक यू। सो देन वी गोट समथिंग कॉल्ड वी परफॉर्मेंस डे। सो मेंबर ऑफ़ द टाइटल या इस एवरी डे इस गेम डे। सो नॉट ओनली डू वी प्रिपेयर आल बेस जस्ट फॉर द गेम डे, बट एवरी सिंगल डे वी नीड टू मेक शर ऑल दिस थिंग्स आर टेकिंग केयर ऑफ़। वी प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर इट, वी so we also know that sometimes athletes have two or three training sessions in a day. How do we go about structuring the game plan for that day to ensure each training session is optimized? And these are simple strategies. So you need your mindset strategy. What is, what is it that the athlete's going to do in the morning they wake up? What are they going to do in the afternoon? Or what are they going to do in the evening? And all these things play a role at these times of the day. So the mindset, the movement training, the nutrition, the recovery. So what recovery are you going to do after morning? morning session to ensure that the afternoon session is optimized. What recovery are you going to do in the evening to make sure the morning session the following day is optimized? What nutrition strategies? What um, recovery strategies from movement are you going to do? Um, and how do you structure your training each day, especially if you're training twice or three times a day, not only each day, within that day, to make sure that each training session is optimized? So that is your performance game plan. How do you make that game plan work um, for each athlete? And you can imagine now you take sports like soccer, rugby, cricket, hockey, who are a team-based sport that are constituting 30, 40, a squad of a very big squad of individuals. Now you've got to train, try and implement a performance game plan for the team, but also a performance game plan that is optimal for each individual. So getting that's why it's really important, which we'll show you just now, to understand the needs of that sport.
So how do we combat, combat, um, gain the competitive edge? So there's a really good paper by Morton, and what he states in that paper, he shows that sports is Darwinian in nature in that only the bigger, faster, and stronger make it to elite level. So again, what is the title of the, one of the titles? We want to get our athletes bigger, faster, stronger. And we need to understand that this is the way sports is going. And one of the things we know is that what athletes are trying to do is train a lot more. But something we should look at is training harder, but also smarter. And there's this constant battle between fitness and fatigue. And what we have to remember is that as fitness increases, so fatigue increases linearly with fitness. But what we do know, there's another inverse relationship between that because if we take rest and recover, fitness keeps increasing, but the fatigue will decrease. So that's why those rest and recovery strategies are so important to understand because we need to get fitter and stronger. And those recovery periods are vital for that because fatigue dissipates during recovery time, but fitness increases during recovery time. And then there was a really good paper by Tucker and they show what makes champions. And what they showed is that every individual has a predefined genetic level. However, with the correct implementation of very, very scientifically sound um, training strategies, we can supersede that genetic level. So that's what I want to show you is the different strategies to avoid um, plateau in performance, especially from a strength and conditioning perspective, to help our athletes achieve the optimum goal. And again, just to show you that the, the, the literature is quite um, sound on this, is that this paper showed that they could predict the winner of a Rugby World Cup by just looking at mass and experience of a team. So again, remember we said athletes are becoming bigger, faster, and stronger. This is one of the evidences of that. And then this is a paper that I spoke about, Norton, where they showed the morphological changes over the 20th century, showing that there's an exponential increase in um, the strength and the fitness and the um, size of athletes over that period. And that's really important. And I published a paper during my master's where we looked at the South African under 20 rugby teams over a 13 year period. And we found that there was an exponential increase in strength, mass and fitness in the same bunch. So even in youth athletes over a period of 13, 13 years, we also saw that they're getting faster, they're getting stronger and they're getting bigger. So this is really important for athletes to understand is that your training, we don't just train for the sake of training, we're training to keep up with the demands that are not only for the sport, but with a change in the demands over time because of the sport, the changes in the sport um, in the modern era. I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah. Ben, I have to say that we have to say that the every day is game day. Every day is game day. It means that every day is a performance day. So now you will be able to say that what you want to do in the morning, what you want to do in the afternoon, what you want to do in the evening mein kya karna hai to is tarah se aap har har din ki preparation karenge aur aur apne bachche apne jo trainee hai uska mindset uska movement uska nutrition kya hona chahiye uska recovery kya hona chahiye to movement aur training mindset nutrition aur recovery in sab ko morning mein bhi dekhenge afternoon evening to kab kab kya kya hona chahiye uska ek pura ek khaka banayenge uska ek चित्रण करेंगे उसका एक मैप बनाएंगे कि आप किस तरह से ये चीजें अपने इंडिविजुअल के अपने एथलीट के लिए कर रहे हैं उसके बाद उन्होंने कहा कि हमारा जैसे ओलंपिक का जो मोटो है बिगर फास्टर स्ट्रॉगर तो हमारा उनका भी मोटो यही है कि अपने अप, अपने एथलीट को कैसे बड़ा कैसे फास्टर और कैसे स्ट्रॉगर बनाया जाए कैन वी शिफ्ट टू द नेक्स्ट वन प्लीज तो तो उन्होंने उन्होंने ये बताया कि आपको बिगर फिटर और स्ट्रॉगर होना पड़ेगा अपने एथलीट को बिगर फिटर और स्ट्रॉगर बनाना पड़ेगा अगर उसको आपको एलिट लेवल पे ले जाना है और उसमें दो बातें हैं फिटनेस के लिए आपको उसकी लोड और इंटेंसिटी बढ़ानी होगी अगर आप उसकी फिटनेस बढ़ाते जाएंगे तो उसको फटीक भी होगा फटीक होगा तो आपको उसके उसको सोना कितना चाहिए फ्यूल का मतलब है उसकी उसकी डाइट क्या होना चाहिए उसका न्यूट्रिशन क्या होना चाहिए और उसकी रिकवरी किस तरह होनी चाहिए ये सब बातों का आपको ध्यान रखना होगा उसके बाद उन्होंने हमें ये भी बताया कि कितने सारे पेपर्स बहुत सारे जो रिसर्च पब्लिश हुई हैं उनके बारे में बताया कि इतनी सारी रिसर्च उन्होंने खुद भी लिखी हैं कुछ पेपर्स और बाकी 
वो लगातार इन सबको पढ़ते हैं और इनसे नॉलेज गेन करके अपने एथलीट्स के ऊपर उसको लगाते हैं तो ये ये एक बहुत बड़ा मैसेज है इस लेक्चर का कि हर एक एलीट कोच को अगर हर एक एलीट कोच अपनी पढ़ाई और अपनी कंटिन्यूस नॉलेज इंप्रूवमेंट ना करे तो उसे कोई तो तो फिर वो अपने ही शेल में रहेगा उसको हमेशा जरूरत है कि अपनी नॉलेज को एनहेंस करता रहे नए नए रिसर्च पेपर्स पब्लिश होते हैं उनको पढ़े और फिर वो अपने एथलीट पे ही उनको आ, उनकी ट्रेनिंग में उनको इस्तेमाल भी करें थैंक यू um so yeah so that was a lot of the fluffy stuff where we need to understand what the athletes are wanting and get a better understanding of the athletes now we come back and we let's start looking at what are the things that we can do to help the athletes and one of the most important things that i feel that we have to ensure is that we need to create a athlete profile which i mentioned a bit earlier and some there's a really good saying that you can't manage what you don't measure so in other words if we're not seeing where our athletes are at currently how do we actually go about designing our programs to improve their performance if we don't know where they're starting from so i'm going to give you just a brief overview of athlete profiling but one thing to remember one thing i think is important is this so when programming our primary aim is to ensure we apply the appropriate stimulus very important um for the athlete sport as well as the individual athlete so not only do we need the appropriate stimulus for the individual athlete but also for the sport or vice versa when the stimulus is incorrect it is likely to lead to performance decline so if we're doing the wrong things the athletes are going to get worse so easy way to remember i just came up with a formula for that so sports physical demand so what is required by the sport plus the athlete profile divided by the stimulus will give you the training transfer so the training transfer is how effective your training is for on field performance which we'll discuss a little bit more just now so if we go in big deeper into performance profiling or athlete profiling what do we do to try and establish where our athletes are at so there's two things we want to look at we want to see what is their energy system profile what is their strength profile and i see there's a lot of participants so there's a lot of different sports so i'm not going to go into depth about it but it's really important that you identify when testing what are the most important things that you want to test that are relative to your sport so for if i take hockey for example i know my players need to be fit so we use aerobic tests such as a yo-yo test to identify their fitness as such and then i do various other tests so we want to do a repeated sprint test to see their anaerobic profile then i can compare those which i'll show you just now and then we got the different strength tests that we'll do as well so then i get a overview of what are their strengths and weaknesses and how do they how are they prepared to cope with the demands of their sport and you can do that for your sport so many you can do it for any sport you just need to select the tests that are relevant to your sport um and also relevant not only to the sport but more importantly to the demands that are placed on them so what are the um, physiological systems that are required in that sport and that's how you decide what testing you can do and we're very lucky in bangalore we use a lot of the exercise physiology department when um over here so they do help us with some of the testing and then i use that data to um to design my testing battery so i'll just show you a quick video this video all i want you to get from the video is um once it plays is give me one second but just all i want you to get from the video is that there's different tests for different sports so i've just chosen a whole lot of different sports i've worked with over the last couple of years and just giving you an example that every sport has different tests um and you need to choose what is relevant to your sport so there's a wide variety of tests that can be done but you need to decide which tests are important for your sport and i encourage you as coaches that are based at any of the sci centers to use the physiology departments to help you guide you in this don't be scared of the science let the science help your programming and from that the data will be really important for you to be able to design your um training programs So that's just an example of a repeated sprint test with the national basketball team in South Africa but as you can see there's just a wide variety of tests that you can do dependent on your sport but the most important thing is how do we use that data so let's go into that a little bit so we spoke earlier about energy development so i said to you that the important part for me is to identify what it is the aerobic capacity what is the anaerobic capacity of my athletes and these are just theoretical hypothetical um examples 
this V VO2 max is their velocity at their VO2 max. So say for example, they are running a yo-yo test. What is their maximum velocity when they completely um, finish the test? So when they stop and they can't go anymore, what is the max velocity they achieved at that? So that's your max, your maximum aerobic speed. And then I've also got their velocity max. So for hockey, generally we can do a 20 or 30 or 40 meter sprint test, but I use GPS and I get their match max velocities to get that for example i know a lot of athletics coaches use max um, velocity as a determinant to um, decide on how they structure their conditioning sessions or their training track training training or you can use something called your anaerobic speed reserve which i use quite a lot and that is the difference between your mass which is maximum aerobic speed as well as your velocity max so for example you see three different athletes here so for example a hockey player a rugby player and a soccer player all with different um, velocity at um, vo2 max and all with different v maxes so that means the aerob anaerobic speed reserve is different so why this is important is that if i say to them guys we're all going to be doing a training session where we're running at six meters per second so this white line up top here it means that for this player, I'm working 20% of anaerobic speed reserve. This player, I'm working 44% of anaerobic speed reserve. And this player is 60% anaerobic speed reserve. So what does that mean is that everyone's training at a very different intensity for the same absolute prescription. So what that will mean is that certain players will fatigue a lot quicker and others won't. So then we've got to look at, okay, how do we go making sure that the physiological adaptation I want in my training session is the same for everyone. Then I've got to look at the difference in anaerobic speed reserve training intensities to ensure that everyone is training at their individual relative intensity. So there's an example there for you just to show you that if we train at the same relative intensity, someone like the hockey player who's got a really big aerobic base will fatigue slower than someone like the rugby player who's got a low aerobic base at a high anaerobic um, base, which means that they will fatigue a little bit quicker at the same relative intensity. That's really important is that the, at the same relative intensity, um, they will fatigue, the fatigue levels will be very, very um, different. And this is just an example of how you can use that data to individualize your training. So you can go athlete's name, you can go their mass, so maximum aerobic speed, then velocity max, and then you get your anaerobic speed reserve. And then you can predict the um, speeds they need to work at at different percentages of the anaerobic speed. So if I want to say, for example, work at 5% of anaerobic speed reserve, which is this column over here, and I want to do intervals of 60 seconds, we'll see because each player's got their own speed that they need to work at, they'll cover different distances. So that's really important to individualize your physiological training specific for your sport, as well as the individuals within your team. And then this is just an example of a sheet where I can go and plan my session with this athlete name, the duration of this of the interval, uh, the rest, and then this the, this one worked at 10% of anaerobic speed reserve, the different speeds for each athlete, and the distance per rep. And as you can see there, in 60 seconds, each athlete covers a different distance because their physiology is different and they're at different levels of um, fitness at this time. Do you want to say anything? Um. It's very difficult to explain so much of data. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Maybe uh, just a Abhi, basic principle. Yeah, Abhi Vain ne bas ye bataya ki aerobic or anaerobic fitness ke liye kis tarah se wo apni sheets ka workout karte hain. To ye samjhana mere liye thoda mushkil hai kyunki ye kafi kafi sara data ek saath unhone bata diya hai. Lekin har athlete, har game ke liye सेम जो एनोरिक्स स्पीड रिजर्व है वो सेम नहीं होता है ये उन्होंने बताया तो हर एक का फेटिक किसी गेम में फेटिक लेवल जल्दी हो जाएगा किसी में देर में होगा डिपेंड करता है कि उसका कितना एरोबिक थ्रेशोल्ड कितना है और उसका एनोरोबिक रिजर्व कितना है तो यही बताया और ये किस तरह से वेरियस आप अपनी पूरी टीम का शीट बना करके कर सकते हैं Let's go ahead. Sure. So if I can summarize that, the most important thing to take home from it is that your conditioning or your any energy system development needs to be individualized. 
So that's a simple, and there's a simple way of looking at it. And you can if take some screenshots if you want, I can provide the PDF at the end as well, um, where you can look at how to structure very basic broad guidelines on working different energy systems. So I'm not gonna go into too much depth there, but you can just take a picture and um, keep that in mind when designing energy system specific um, training sessions. This is just an example of what I got with um, GPS data. So just to give you an idea, not to go in depth about it, these are different sessions. So this is, for example, when you play 6v6, 7v7, 10v10, and 5v5. And you can see the different responses in the heart rate over here. So this blue line up top here is the heart rate. These big lines, these towers that you see here are the velocity. So this is the running, this is their heart rate response. There's a rest period, so you can see a decreasing heart rate there, and then they're going to the next interval, and then increase the heart rate. And then importantly, what you can see is that there's initially a linear increase in that heart rate and a slight plateau as you get into, as they get used to the training stimulus or, or into the game. Those are examples of hockey specific sessions, and then these are examples of conditioning specific sessions. So these are 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off. The heart rate responds to that, the decrease in heart rate, the velocity they're running at, and so on and so forth. And this is an example of a yo-yo test. So everyone knows a yo-yo test, you're just running up and down over 20 meters to a beep. You can see that it's very constant, that velocity, and the heart rate gradually increases all the way until the athlete finishes that um, session. So that's just an example of different, how the body responds to different sessions. Israeli we're going to go to during training stuff shortly. But one of the things that I like to look at is your uh, dynamic strength index. And that is just looking at a ballistic movement divided by a dynamic movement. So, for example, if you want to do it on your own, you can do a counter movement jump divided by a squat jump. So, one takes out that stretch shortening cycle and one just use, and one uses a stretch shortening cycle. And then you're looking at the difference between the two for your athletes. And this is just a guideline on looking at your scoring. So a low score would be anything, a ratio of 0 0.6, a, me, a medium score between 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So then the athlete needs to focus on both strength and power. And a high score of greater than eight, the athlete needs to focus on max strength development. So just to show you how to look at force velocity data, this is a really nice app that you can download for quite cheap. It's called the MyJump app. And you can look at your force velocity profile of your athlete with different loads. So this athlete, what you can see here, this is his or hers force velocity profile. This is optimum, which means that they are way off optimum and they need to develop force. So they're not strong enough to maintain that velocity as the weights change in their, in their jump. So ultimately, we want a little bit of a right shift of this line to get to that optimal development over here. So for this athlete specifically, we need to develop their strength. So that's why force velocity profiles are important for us because we want to see what do we need to work on? Do we need to work on plyometric development? Do we need to work on um, neuromuscular components? Do we need to work on absolute strength? And this way we can see where our athlete falls on this force velocity profile to design our strength training, which you'll see becomes important when I show you the different types of strength training that we can do. And then this is an example of a perfect relationship of a force velocity profile. So generally when there's a perfect relationship, we want to develop velocity because their force is good. So we want to develop their velocity. So there's a 0% difference between the two. And obviously this sort of profile you'll see in your, either your horizontal jumpers or your vertical type jumpers. So athletes as such. And this is just an example of the different weights we use. So we use 20, 30, 50, and 60 kilograms and then the force and the velocity profile that exists at the different weights that we used in that one. And this is an example of a force velocity profile using data from an athlete that I work with. And then you can see that you can go maximum strength development. You'll see the velocity is pretty slow, but the um, wattage is high and then the weight is high. So 200 kilograms at 0 0.3 meters per second, bench press and so on and so forth. And it just allows you to paint a picture of how your athlete is doing with different loads. And then I can prescribe specifically if I want to work on power, he needs to work, for example, a squat jump at 50 kilograms is where he gets his max power in that exercise. Or hang clean at 70 kilograms is where he gets max power for that um, for hang clean exercise and so on and so forth as you go through the force velocity profile. 
of athletes, which I'll explain a little bit more when we go um, into the strength uh, training stuff just now. Then there's also something called your active strength index, which is basically your flight time divided by ground contact time. I use that a lot because I use it for neuromuscular fatigue status identification of the athletes. I'll just give you an example of what it looks like. So there's two videos where you'll see the athletes jumping now once it loads. So you'll see yeah, the athlete jumps. So it's just a simple counter movement jump. She's on a force plate over here. So the internet seems a little bit bad. She's on a force plate over here. I'm collecting the data over here just to see what is the force velocity profile and what is the neuromuscular fatigue status of this athlete prior to us playing our match. So this was done in Commonwealth Games. So that's one method of looking at your force velocity profile. And then there's a second one, which is known as your pogo hop test, which I'll show you now once it loads. So yeah, same athlete doing a pogo hop test, looking at the active strength index. So she jumps up and down repeatedly 10 times, and then the data comes through there for me as we look through it. So once we've got all that data, then we can go look at well, how do we put that as a profile together to ensure that we can explain to our athletes where they're sitting. So this is an example of an individual athlete profile. So I get all the data of what we've collected. I compare her to herself as well as the group average and any normative data that we've got. And then I give her a longitudinal look at it. So this is what she's looking like over time to see that she's improving. The red marks over there are her goals for the next set of testing. And then most importantly, or most one thing I really like about this type of report is this over here is an indication of if they are better or below the group average in a specific test. So it's a Z score. If the graph is above the line, so the line's there, if it's above the line, they're better than the group average. If it's below the line, they're worse than the group average. So it's a very simple, quick look at how they are doing compared to the group average. And then this is a team report where I can look at how's the team doing overall over time. So I just got a line of best fit in these areas over here to see what is it that they're doing. So we know for speed, we wanna see the line de declining like this. But for example, for yo-yo test, we wanna see it going up. So these are just ways that I would like to, what the most important thing is to take home is to understand that we need to create a profile for our athletes. We need to compare them to something. And we need to understand where they're starting so we can know, okay, what do we need to do to improve their performance as we go along in our training program? One minute. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, what uh, Wayne ne kya bataya hum sabko ki usne ek athlete ki puri profile create ki ye different different jo aapko test dikhaye ye test karke usne athlete ki puri profile banayi aur usme ye paya ki isko ab mere ko kahan le jana hai ye basic base profile banane ke baad unko malum pad gaya ki kis tarah se iske strength aur conditioning ko hame guide karna hai aur jisse ki unki जो भी लेवल्स हैं वो और भी अच्छे हो जाए और ये बेसिक ग्राफ्स हैं डिफरेंट डिफरेंट टाइम्स के और पूरी टीम के भी ग्राफ्स इस तरह से वो बनाते हैं अब मैं आप लोगों को एक बात बता दूं कि बेसिक काउंटर मूवमेंट जंप वगैरह के लिए आपको फोर्स प्लेटफॉर्म चाहिए लेकिन वो थोड़ा सा इट इज मोर नॉट कॉम्प्लिकेटेड बट हाँ काउंटर मूवमेंट फोर्स प्लेटफॉर्म इज एक्सपेंसिव और वो ज्यादा सब जगह अवेलेबल नहीं होता है तो फिर उसको करना मुश्किल है बट लेकिन आप अपना एथलीट का अगर प्रोफाइल बनाना चाहते हैं आप सिंपल आपका एथलीट नॉर्मल 12-14 साल का है और अगर आप उसका प्रोफाइल बनाते हैं तो उसके लिए भी सिंपल टेस्ट अवेलेबल हैं आप बहुत सारे सिंपल टेस्ट अवेलेबल हैं और आप इस तरह से धीरे अपने आप वो टेस्ट करके उसका डेटा बनाना शुरू कर सकते हैं आपको उन टेस्ट करने के लिए कोई भी स्पेसिफाइड मशीनरी नहीं चाहिए कुछ भी नहीं चाहिए जैसे आप एरोबिक टेस्ट करना चाहते हैं फिटनेस का उसके लिए सिंपल टेस्ट हैं वर्टिकल मूवमेंट वर्टिकल मूवमेंट जंप है वो एक सिंपल सी जंप होती है उसके लिए आपको कोई भी एपरेटस नहीं चाहिए कुछ नहीं चाहिए और स्टैंडिंग लॉन्ग जंप है उसके लिए आपको कुछ भी नहीं चाहिए तो वेरियस पैरामीटर्स जो बॉडी के हैं स्ट्रेंथ के हैं वो आप सिंपल टेस्ट करके एक बार नोट कर सकते हैं स्टार्ट करने से पहले नोट कर सकते हैं 
और उनको किस तरह से आपको आगे बढ़ाना है अपने आप डिजाइनिंग करने के बाद लगातार वो टेस्ट हर दो तीन महीने के इंटरवल के बाद कर सकते हैं और अपने एथलीट की प्रोफाइल आराम से अपने ग्राफ बना सकते हैं बैठ के अपने नॉर्मल ग्राफ पेपर पे भी आप वो ग्राफ बना सकते हैं तो ये जरूरी नहीं है कि आपके पास बहुत हाई टेक इक्विपमेंट हो सिंपल टेस्ट भी अवेलेबल है हर चीज करने के लिए अगर आप टॉप एंड स्पोर्ट्स की वेबसाइट पे जाएंगे तो आपको हर चीज के लिए सिंपल टेस्ट मिल जाएंगे थैंक यू थैंक यू वेन यू नो वट आई टोल्ड देम I yes. told them that uh, suppose you don't have this complicated, I mean, like this post platform yeah. or something, yeah, this which are, which are you know not available everywhere. There are simpler yeah. ways to make a yeah. profile of the athlete. Hundred percent, yeah. That is so, what I'm telling you. That way, as you mentioned, top sports. Yeah, it's some um, good testing um, protocols. Nice. Okay, so we're going to move on to the advanced strength training methodology, and this is a really exciting part for me because it's um, all the nuts and bolts of really getting into depth about how to do slightly more advanced strength conditioning and how to avoid plateaus and those sort of things. One thing I want to remember is that the title of the presentation was "Beyond the Brainless Model," and so this statement is what puts it all into a nutshell for us: is that the fundamental principle of strength training is that all strength increases are initiated by neuromuscular stimulus. And there's a really good book called Super Training, and another one called um, Science and Practice of Strength and Conditioning, um, that really put those, this into a context. And it's really important to understand because every movement is still initiated by the brain. So this is just a diagram that I created, and I'm not going to go into depth, but I know it was covered a little bit on Saturday where you need to understand that the brain regulates everything. So we can. For example, I've got a barbell on my back. We get sensory inputs. The brain registers, okay, there's something on the back. And then it starts getting these responses. Okay, what must I do now to with this external load on my back? And all these physiological inputs are previous experience. And that's really important when you design your program because the previous experience tells a lot to the brain and how to react to certain stimulus. Um, what is the expected movement, the exercise that is, needs to be executed, and then the physiological inputs and the muscle excitation and so on and so forth. All that gets goes to the brain, and then that output eventually works into me being able to jump or throw the bar or push a weight or something to that effect. So I don't want to go into too much depth there, but just to get an idea, the brain regulates everything, and it starts with as soon as that barbell or external load is on, the, on your back or holding your hands, the brain starts doing things to understand what is a movement that I need to create. And that's the gist of the whole presentation is to understand that the brain is really important in the processes. So we also know that there's, we've got different um, processes of how the muscles are activated, recruited, and so on and so forth. So we've got um, the selective recruitment principle, we've got the size principle, and so on and so forth that I know that has been covered a little bit. But what I want to explain is that What's important to understand, those principles are good up to a point. And if we apply advanced strength training methodologies, we can change the physiology to ensure that our athletes do not plateau and they are getting fitter and stronger. So before I go on to that, I just wanted to remind us, and I know this graph was kind of showed on Saturday, but the difference, we know that eccentrically we can create a lot more force and concentrically we are then concentrically. And at different points in these contractions, so the eccentric contraction and the concentric contraction, there's different methodologies that we can use within the strength training modalities that I'm going to show you to affect this side of the graph, to affect this point of the graph, to affect here, and so on and so forth. So understanding the graph is really important. And remember what I showed you with the force velocity profile, understanding where your athletes fit within that will help you design um, a better strength training program to ensure you are stimulating the athlete correctly. And then we know there's different types of muscle fibers, so the type one, type two, and so on and so forth, but uh, the physiology has been covered, so I don't want to go into too much depth there. Then there's also the, um, the law of diminishing returns. So what that is, is that the, they, at a certain point, as the athlete gets older, the more you do, they don't as adapt as quickly and as well. So the younger athletes got a lot more, I call younger athletes like a sponge. They just absorb everything and they are able to adapt a lot easier than older athletes. So this, this is a, uh, um, a term called accommodate, accommodation. And what that means is that the athletes get to a point where they don't see as greater returns on the investment in strength and conditioning as what they did when they were younger. But there's ways and means we can adapt this because 
if we say to our athletes that they're not going to get better if they do any more or anything different, I think we're lying to them because I'll show you where we can uh, manipulate the training better to get these advancements. So importantly, there needs to be a balance between monotony and strain. So monotony is that average training load and divided by the standard deviation, and the strain is a training load divided by the uh, multiplied by the monotony. So again, that stress and strain relationship, the rest and recovery relationship is really important. So if we can get that balance right, our athletes are able to adapt. And I know this has been spoken about a little bit where we've got the undulating loads, and this is really important because if we just keep loading our athletes linearly in a block periodization type model, they will not adapt over time. There has, there has to be periods of high load, there has to be periods of high intensity and so on and so forth. So following an undulated load type pattern in your periodization model does help athletes adapt more consistently to their training because they're getting better recovery patterns. So why I say that athletes don't have accommodation as easily as what people think is because we take the brain out of the equation. Yes, um, from a muscular standpoint, it is possible that we can't get any bigger the muscles or whatever it might be. But there's really good research on neuroplasticity within strength training now. And all that neuroplasticity is, that, is the brain's ability to adapt the neural structures to a stimulus. And that is important because what they also showed is that there's been MRI evidence of neuroplastic changes associated with improvements in muscle size and motor function following upper extremity exercises in cerebral palsy patients. And that's really important to remember because most people believe that if you've in CP patients, that it's very difficult to get um, changes in the neural structures. So if it's possible in these type of patients and athletes, then we got to look at question, what can we do from an elite performance standpoint to ensure that we're getting these neuroplastic adaptations in our athletes as well? Um, and the same has been shown in people who suffer from depression, is that that hippocampus actually gets a little bit smaller in the brain, but with exercise that can actually increase that hippocampus size and decrease um, depression rates. So that neuroplastic nature of the brain is important when we're considering strength training principles. Uh, do you want to say anything? Okay. 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 And then this is another graph which is important for us because what, what, what it shows is we can get these secondary neural adaptations. So we know this is the early phase of a training stimulus, early training phase of a young athlete. But with advanced strength training techniques, the most important thing I want you to know is that we can get the secondary neural adaptations. So manipulating our undulating effects of periodization, plus manipulating the types of strength and conditioning that we do, we can get these secondary adaptations. So it's really important that the manipulation of our training programs are really specific to the requirements of our athletes. Uh, I will just stop you here. Yes, please. Uh, Abhi Vain ne ye bataya कि फोर्स कर्व बताए उसके बाद ये भी बताया कि लॉ ऑफ डिमिनिशिंग रिटर्न वैसे हमें बताता है जो हमारी स्ट्रेंथ ट्रेनिंग का प्रिंसिपल है कि एक एक लेवल के बाद आप और आगे नहीं बढ़ सकते हैं और वहां पे स्टैग्नेशन आ जाएगा तो उसके बाद परफॉर्मेंस ड्रॉप ही होगा बढ़ेगा नहीं लेकिन ये बात उन्होंने बोला कि ये बात यंगर और मतलब इसको मैनिपुलेट किया जा सकता है और और ज्यादा हम आगे बढ़ सकते हैं ये बताया उसके बाद ये भी बताया कि जो आपका नॉर्मल पीरियडाइजेशन कर्व होता है उसमें आपको एक्सप्लोसिव स्ट्रेंथ पावर ये ऑल्टरनेटिवली कैसे आप अपनी ट्रेनिंग के साथ कर सकते हैं उन्होंने ये ग्राफ्स दिखा करके ये क्लियरली बताया उन्होंने फिर कुछ और भी चीजें बताई कि किस तरह से हम अपनी मसल फाइबर को और भी ज्यादा बढ़ा सकते हैं तो ये सब चीजें अभी वो बता रहे थे थोड़ी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड है मैं भी इतनी अच्छी तरह से नहीं समझा सकता हूँ तो लेकिन आप ये सिर्फ बहुत ज्यादा एलिट और बहुत ही अच्छे मतलब जो ऑलरेडी बहुत ट्रेन एथलीट्स हैं उनके ऊपर आप ये प्रिंसिपल्स अप्लाई कर सकते हैं नॉर्मल एथलीट्स के ऊपर जो और छोटे एथलीट्स के ऊपर आप ये ज्यादा प्रिंसिपल्स अप्लाई ना करें और अपनी जो नॉर्मल स्ट्रेंथ ट्रेनिंग है वही रखें ओके 
Okay, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip. I'm going to go through one or two things very quickly because I want to show the advanced strength training methods, and I've got quite a few videos that I'd like to show you. So this is just another force for, um, force time curve. Um, this is actually the rate of force development. And what we would want to do is this, for example, is an untrained athlete. And in a trained athlete, we want to get a left-hand shift of this uh, rate of force development. And the way we can do that is by ensuring that we do some sort of heavy resistance training. We stimulate the neural, neural, um, neural pathways of the um, athlete. We do some sort of ballistic training. And therefore, to improve the power, we, we need to either improve force max or velocity max, or we need to improve both. And that's why it's important to understand where our athlete fits on that force velocity profile. Okay, so we're going to go into the really nice stuff of the um, programming side of things and the advanced strength training methodologies. One thing I just want to point out is that it's really important to understand this concept. General preparatory exercises, special preparatory exercises, special development exercise and competition exercise. As we move up the pyramid over here, these exercises become more and more specific and to the sport that your individuals, um, your athletes are taking part in. So for example, up here, if we take a javelin throw, for example, this over here would be actually the doing javelin throwing. All these things over here would be to support the muscles and the energy systems within that sport. So important just to take our message from here, is that as we go up this pyramid, the more specific it becomes to your um, sport that you are um, working with. So we all want to improve ballistic ability. So the most important thing and the easy thing to remember with plyometric training, for example, if we take a jump, the ability to decelerate, absorb, potentiate. I know you heard that word on um, Saturday, which I'll explain a little bit more about later, and accumulate that energy and as quickly as possible, transition that energy into a um, express and accelerate um, upwards, as an example. So we've got two components of biometrics. We've got the um, mechanical model, where it's elastic and the muscular tendinous junction, a quick stretch, and then uh, the ability to use that quick stretch, which is the energy that's um, come from that quick stretch with a concentric contraction of the muscle to produce force. And then we've got the neurophysiological model, which is really important for me, because remember we spoke about not taking the brain out of the equation, understanding that the muscle spindles react to it, so the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon are small little organisms found in your muscles that either help the contraction or react to a stretch of the contraction. So it's really important to understand that, but just having a basic um, understanding of that. So during biometric exercise, the muscle spindles are stimulated by the stretch, causing reflexive muscle action and the reflexive response potentiates. So there's a potentiation word again, increases activity of the agonist muscle, increasing the force production. So all these systems play a role, not just the muscular system plays a role in it. So there again, again, understanding that the brain, everything is stimulated up here and then the muscles react to that stimulus that is placed up there. So there's different responses to the brain, different responses from the muscular tendinous system, as well as um, the muscular system that we've spoken about already. Okay, so just moving on so we can get through it, I've, I've gone quite long, is understanding that our strength training has to be specific to the demands that are expected in the sport. So there needs to be kinetic similarities, there needs to be movement similarities, there needs to be neurophysiological similarities. And we spoke about this earlier where we want to identify what are the demands of the sport and how do we work backwards to understand what do we need to apply for our athlete to get better. There are some sports, so for example, if I use hockey as an example again, there are multiple forces on, on the body at any one time. So the athlete has to run with the stick, stop a ball, change direction, accelerate, decelerate, visual cues, all these things play a role in, in your sport. So how do we apply it and understand these different forces that are um, exerted on our athletes within our sport and apply it in our strength training routines becomes really important to get the best training transfer from what we do in the gym, for example, to what, we, what the outputs are in the actual sport. So I'm gonna go through four or five different methods of strength training. And the first one, if we just, sorry, this is just, um, if you want to take, um, Screenshots of this, this is just basic definition of it. I will send the PDF anyway, so you'll get all this information. So we just look at the advanced strength training methodologies. So what are these accommodating resistances that we want to look at? I know the 
um, A sin and B sending curves were spoken about the other day. But I just want to go into and I'll show you some videos of how we apply these things. So there's four or five different aspects of advanced strength training. That's variable accommodating resistance, eccentric training, isometrics, overspeed training, and training for maximum power. And all these play a different role at different times in your strength and conditioning. So one thing we need to understand is that accommodating resistance, you need to have an increase in your strength is required at the top of the lift, so that's your ascending top curve. And conversely, the resistance that is required at the bottom of a lift, so if we're doing a bench press, for example, if we've got a band attached to it, we're pushing up, there's more resistance at the top, so there's greater strength required at the top. When we come down, that's unloaded with the band, so then there's less strength required. Also, the other important point is that we're overloading that eccentric portion of the movement to hopefully create, create a potentiating effect of that concentric movement pattern. And that becomes really important in our exercise prescription. And then also training for power max, important to understand that it's a range of percentage of one RM for different lifts and different athletes that will be um, produce a power max. If you go back to that force velocity curve I showed you of the athlete, we had four or five different lifts under power and they all had different loads that were specific to maximum power output for that specific athlete. So getting an understanding of where your athlete falls is quite important. And then the eccentric training part is also important because we already showed you that eccentricity we can produce more force than compared to concentricity. And that becomes really, really important. So I just want to show you a video of all these different methods. So this is an example of an athlete doing a jerk and you see the band is attached with weights to it. So what that's going to create is create instability. And this is an advanced method that we can use because they're going to have to really counteract that oscillating effect of the bar and the, um, because the band's attached to it. And they really have to get that um, stability going good. Here's an example. I just want to turn the volume down a little bit. Here's an example of a banded split lunge. So we've got weights as well as a band. So we're overloading. Just going to go back a little bit. We're overloading that eccentric to create a greater concentric. And here's another example of a different type of band exercise. Um, this is specifically for a goalie we use, where we're overloading. Again, we spoke earlier, sometimes we don't have the different equipment that is required for um, force velocity type measurement. This is a really easy, easy method. So what I did here, we got a band with the, ath uh, with the athlete doing bench press, and we're doing time sets. So I want him to do three reps as fast as he can. So this is just a way to increase his intent. So he moves the bar as quickly as he can, and then he's up. This is a Czech Republic um, beach volleyball Olympic team. So yeah, we're overloading the um, squat pattern with the band. So as they're going down, it unloads. As they're coming up, as they get taller, and you can see we also put them on a, sorry, let me go back quickly, put them on a platform to really overload that extension part of it. So you can imagine when they jump, they really need to create a really high um, force output to be able to produce that movement. Um, uh, you'll see in the next one, another overloaded um, band exercise. So it's just a shrug pull uh, with heavy weights, heavy band. Here's a different aspect of it where we're actually assisting the movement. So I know they spoke about the sticking point um, on Saturday. So yeah, we're assisting that sticking point. And again, it's a time set. So we're looking at max movement as fast as we can over a period of time. So I think it was a 10 second set if I remember correctly. As fast, these are South African kayakers, um, moving the bar as fast as you can for a period of time. So time-based sets are quite nice because you know if I can get 10 reps in 10 seconds, I'm moving at one meter per second as an example. Um, so it's an easy way to try and get um, velocity-based training. This is a long jumper, he's doing, so this is an interesting one because what we did here is we took out the eccentric component and dominated the concentric portion. So he's Weight is um, resting on the safety bars over here. And he's going to just drive up as fast as he can into that position there. So it's no eccentric, only focusing on that concentric movement pattern. So taking out that stretch shortening cycle and really dominated that concentric portion of the lift. Then this is just for max power development. So we've got dumbbells, we're doing a split jerk. Um, so a split snatch. Um, and it's a really nice way of doing a really fast exercise into maximum power. Different, so I'll just go back one step. Um, there's a swimmer, 
we also again focusing on the concentric portion of the lift. So going from uh, safety bars, eccentric, so overloading the eccentric, players got the weight of her head, overloading the eccentric trunk muscles, accommodating resistance as well. So this is just a ascinetic machine where we look at testing muscular imbalances. And this is accommodating resistance because the harder he pushes, the harder it resists against, against him, um, and so on and so forth. He has another band exercise for a long jumper that we did. So I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit because otherwise I'm gonna go up this long. An overloaded band exercise in the um, trap bar deadlift, um, really driving up strong, overloading that top portion of the lift, unloading the bottom portion. He has an eccentric lunge into an explosive um, pull. So it's going down slow, holding for three seconds, and then exploding up. Um, he has an overloaded band exercise coming forward, we use more for rehab. So the band's pulling the mesh forward, for example, forward. she has to stabilize a overloaded speed movement coming forward to ensure that knee's getting into a good position to decelerate her movement pattern. These are just different examples of jumps that you can do. So he has an overloaded eccentric and concentric movement. Um, yeah, we're going to a slightly different one. So overloaded eccentric concentric to an unloaded concentric to activate those higher end motor units. There's a completely unloaded jump. So we're really focusing on fast ground reaction um, forces there. That uh, was ground reaction time, sorry. And he has a pogo jump or loaded pogo jump over there. Okay. Still with me? Yes, yes. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, then we are on the stuff. So I'm gonna I'll just show you basically what we look at. Velocity based stuff is quite important because what we want to see is as velocity decreases throughout the movement, we know that the that the fatigue it could be that fatigue setting in. So we also shown in some of the research that at about 30% of velocity loss shows where the start of the lactate accumulation starts. So if we're doing, say for example, hand cleans, and I've got a velocity loss at 30% uh, 30 over a period of two or three reps, I know at that point that lactate's gonna increase linearly with that decrease in velocity loss, which means fatigue's gonna set in. So that's why we use velocity training as a marker of not only fatigue, but intent. So we can use these funny devices over here, which this one's a push band, this is a gym away. And all these things do give us actual velocity outputs in the lift. So how fast is an athlete lifting that, um, that bar or that weight or throwing the ball or something to that effect? And I'll just click on here to give you a basic indication of what are the recommended velocities for different types of strength modalities that we work in. So remember the strength uh, force velocity curve. These are the different parts of the force velocity curve. And yeah, we've got right on top of that force velocity curve. And yeah, we've got right at the bottom of the force velocity curve. And the different velocities you should be uh, attaining to train these specific mechanisms of strength, as an example. And there's a nice study done on, I think it was Chinese um, weightlifters showing different types of velocities at different percentages of 1RM for different lifts um, and so on and so forth. I'll just show you a video of how it looks for the velocity stuff. We've already seen the jump one, which um, will come up first and then I'll show you the other ones. Um, so again, there's that device that's a push band. But I'm just gonna skip past this one so I can show you the, how we use it in a different way to get velocities. So that's another reactive strength, strength index test. And yeah, you can see the data collecting on the movement jump, as well as the data collected on the push band. So you, I'm using two different devices to get the data. But again, like we said, you don't have to use these fancy, I'm just giving information on advanced uh, methodologies of training. And then you can get the forces and all and so on and so forth. And then just to skip ahead a little bit, so yeah, we're doing a lift with the, let me just turn this down. We're doing a lift with the push band. So the push band's attached to the bar and the athlete can see the velocity which they're lifting at and creates really good competitive atmosphere because she can see how fast she's lifting the bar or the weight at that time.
Okay, then there's something called the triphasic system, which I'm just going to breeze over quickly. And basically, triphasic system has been um, written by a man named Carl Dietz, which is a good, really good strength and conditioning coach from America. And they look at different blocks of eccentric, isometric, and concentric focus. And generally, in this first three blocks, they, about, they spend about two weeks at each block. And generally, it's an um, undulating model with medium, high, and low intensities. Um, focusing on one, one of the lifts on, on the Monday, for example, and one of the lifts on a Friday, for example, will be an eccentric focus. So, for example, we're doing a squat. We'll do a six-second down movement and then move it up as fast as possible. So that would be the eccentric focus for that block. And the same sort of patterns would be used for isometric as well as a concentric focus and then two weeks of power focus and then a week or so, depending on what you need, for the peaking focus and generally these two phases the loads are very light but we're looking for maximum velocity outputs or maximum intent so moving the bar or the external weight as fast as you can and that's an example of how it's broken in different um, phases and we also got something called your conjugated sequencing this is one that's used more frequently so you got your max effort day which is generally 90 percent um, 1RM at 1 to 3 reps and building up to that maximal effort. Then you got a dynamic effort day, which is known as your speed day, which is high velocities, high number of sets, lower reps with maximum intent at about 45 to 65% of 1RM. And then you got a repeated effort um, day, which is your muscular endurance day, high reps and sets with medium loads and it can be very fatiguing. The important thing with this system is that it's undulating in effect and then we are training different systems on each day. So the chances of fatigue are a lot less. And then the last one, the post-activation post potentiation one is really important for us because there are different ways to increase our um, force output. And post-activation potentiation is that where we do an exercise prior to doing another exercise that's gonna help us perform the second exercise better. So for example, there's something called complex training, which we use a 85 to 90% of one RM compound exercise. So for example, a squat, and then going into a light ballistic type exercise, for example, a squat jump. Um, and then the execution of the squat jump should be better because of that potentiation effect. I'm not gonna get into the physiology because we're running out of time um, of that, but yeah, those are the proposed theories of it so we get increase in myosin chain uh, cross bridges and so on and so forth and uh, um, this is new research that's come out but only proven in animal studies so far where you're changing the angle of penation through a high a heavy lift prior to then we also got something called french contrast clusters as well as pre-event farming sessions so i want to show the videos because i can talk you through it and that's a little bit better for you to understand uh, just wait for it to come. So this is an example of French contrast. So we go one heavy exercise, for example, a quarter squat, into a ballistic exercise that's slightly loaded. So this is an example of an accentuated eccentric box jump. So you can see here TJ is using a um, dumbbells, drops them before he jumps. So he overloads an eccentric to provide a greater concentric. From there, he gets 30 seconds rest after that one. And then you'll go into a power movement, you'll see it's an overhead snatch. So an overhead snatch, which again leads to another potentiating effect of the last exercise in the four exercises, which here is a drop jump, drop jump, explode as fast as you can. Um, so yeah, so the, the French contrast is generally four exercises, one very heavy exercise, a loaded ballistic exercise, a power exercise, and then a, a either unloaded or, um, uh, or assisted type of movement in the last one, which I'll show you in the second round of it. So here we got deadlift, banded base deadlift, a multi-box jump, we got a squat jump, and then right at the end, we've got assisted um, jumps. So all these play a different role in ensuring that we can get some sort of potentiating effect in that French contrast. This is a complex set, for example. So we're using a heavy single leg lift to get a potentiating effect. So the first exercise needs to be really heavy. So it's heavy dumbbells, small box um, to bring max force into a um, counter movement jump with weights. 
Okay, here's another example. Just a general squat into a seated counter movement jump. Again, heavy squat into multiple jumps over here. So the idea, remember, is that the first exercise needs to overload and potentiate and improve the second exercise. There's another example, explosive um, overhead throw. Um, and the last example, again, single leg step up into a ballistic um, single leg um, hurdle jump. Then we also got the priming, priming sessions. And priming sessions have shown what we use them for is to improve our on-field performance. I know athletes use it a lot. We use it in hockey quite a bit where we do some sort of pre-match exercise or strength training to elicit better performance on the pitch. Because what they know, what they have shown in the research is that as the day goes on, our testosterone levels decrease, but with a strength stimulus early in the morning, we can try and we can keep the testosterone levels higher to improve performance on the pitch. But these are just different examples of some of the things that I use as um, priming sessions. We do them three, about four to five hours prior to a match. Um, and then that just primes them for that match. And these are just different examples of different exercises you can do. Everything's very light, moving at max speed for that potentiating effect. Um, important thing with this sort of priming exercise is that you do not fatigue your athletes because if you start doing exercises that end up fatiguing your athletes, um, you're going to have negative effects. So I've got one last slide to show you before we finish up. And we go all the way, 100, 360 degrees back to you can't manage what you don't measure. And I'm just going to give you an example of what, we, what I collect as well every day is looking at wellness data for our athletes. They submit on the cell phone. I just give them a Google Docs form. They submit their data to me. I create a database on Excel where I've got different data. I've got collected, I analyze it and create reports from that to identify not only where they are from a testing perspective, from physiology, but how they're looking wellness, their training load, GPS data, and so on and so forth. And that allows me to understand the athletes every single day on what they are doing. Just a take home message from me would be, one has to be able to um, thread together scientific knowledge and sports technique while listening to one's own feelings and the feelings of the athlete in question. It is at this point that coaching ceases to be a science and becomes an art. And that's the important part is understanding the art and the science of coaching and performance. Sorry, I too went well over time there. My, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> That was an excellent uh, presentation, Wayne. Thank you so much. Uh, no jo presentation thi, Mr. Lombard ki wo, uh, higher level ke athletes ke liye thi. Aur, uh, unhone sare concept power increase karne ke liye, velocity increase karne ke liye, fir, uh, strength increase karne ke liye, sari different different exercise karke, tarike karke unhone samjaya aur bataya hai. आप इधर एक वीडियोस भी दिखाएं ये बेसिकली उन एलिट एथलीट्स के लिए प्रोग्राम उन एलिट कोचेस के लिए प्रोग्राम था जो एलिट एथलीट्स को भी ट्रेनिंग करते हैं और हर एज लेवल पे एलिट एथलीट्स हमारे डेवलपमेंट लेवल पे भी हो सकते हैं और टॉप लेवल पे भी होते हैं तो सबके लिए ये प्रोग्राम मैंने स्पेसिफिकली इसके लिए रखा था कि आपको जस्ट एक छोटा सा इनसाइट देने के लिए कि आप कि किस तरह से स्ट्रेंथ और कंडीशनिंग की तैयार की डिफरेंट डिफरेंट लेवल्स होते हैं और टॉप लेवल क्या है वो आज मैं दिखाना चाहता था हो सकता है कि आज की प्रेजेंटेशन बहुत सारे लोगों के लिए लागू ना हो क्योंकि वो बच्चों के साथ और और मतलब डेवलप ग्रास रूट लेवल के साथ काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन लेकिन हर कोच को ये मालूम होना चाहिए कि आज की तारीख में कितना एडवांसमेंट है और आप किस तरह से एडवांस करके मॉनिटर कर सकते हैं और अपने स्ट्रेंथ और कंडीशनिंग के प्रोग्राम्स को डिजाइन कर सकते हैं मेन पर्पस आज की प्रेजेंटेशन का ये था तो अभी हम थोड़े से क्वेश्चन और आंसर्स लेंगे वेन कैन यू टेक सम क्वेश्चंस प्लीज या प्रॉब्लम इन दिन बॉक्स 
Yes, yeah, sure. One second. Some of them, it's already 6.22. So about yeah, 10 sorry. minutes of questions, please. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem at all. I just want to, sorry, I just need to get my screen right because my one screen's broken. So I'm just trying to see how to get the question. One second for me. Can you see the questions your side by any chance? Because I can't yeah, see. Yeah, I can see point. the questions. Okay. Uh, Would you mind reading the, any of the important ones? Because I can't, for some reason, my screen is a bit funny. The landing face after a block jump in volleyball. How the muscle contraction takes place in lower limbs in view of sustaining no injuries? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I think the key there is the landing technique rather than the muscle action. Although um, what we do know is if rate of force development is slow in athletes, so the ability of that muscle to contract fast and stabilize that joint, their risk of injury is higher. So trying to train that they can stabilize and recruit those muscles through various aspects of the strength training sessions that I showed you, um, through different force velocity profiling, force development and so forth. What you can do is train a muscle to stabilize as soon as that the foot lands on the ground, that the muscle is able to stabilize the compromised joints um, really well. Um, the key there, though, is trying to get them to land in a really good position every time, which is not always easy because obviously in a block jump, you're jumping pretty high. And then it's a dynamic environment, so your landing position always change. But there, I would say the key is if they're strong and are able to stabilize really quickly as soon as they hit the ground, um, they probably reduce their risk of injury. I hope that answers it. Okay. Mm. Uh, then there's a question on uh, software. Which software you are using to develop these curves? Um, uh, very, very sophisticated Excel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I don't have anything. Uh, I will answer that question. I know uh, the answer. Pavan, uh, this question, ka, aapke question ka answer is that they are using Excel koi use kar rahe aur koi, aisa koi, uh, specific software. Nahi use kar rahe Sari jo unhone sheets banayi hai, wo Excel par hai, aur wo Excel ke hi curves ko use karte hai. Can you give more insight on AFST training and oscillating isometric training? Yeah, so it's quite a difficult one to actually do. So oscillating isometrics, um, it depends what type of equipment you got, but a lot of things that we try to do is get athletes to actually give that external load. So for example, if we get into a split lunge position and the athletes in a isometric position in a split lunge, and then getting athletes to a, give external resistance or down on them as an oscillating effect can work. Um, the other aspect of the oscillating one is, for example, like we did with the bands, the one exercise I showed you, the jerk with the, the bands can create an oscillating effect. Um, but it's not always that easy, and I don't, I don't know if it's the most important one to focus on, um, but those are examples of trying to increase that oscillating effect is you need some sort of external stimulus that is, is random in nature to create that oscillating effect. But um, yeah, you can use your, each other, your athletes as training partners that can do it. Um, or you can add bands, you can add chains. So when you're using a chain and as the chain goes up, those chains start moving and creates an oscillating effect. So the stabilization has to be a bit more. Um, so chains, chains, bands, and external um, player, player oscillating effects from a player are good ways of doing it. Oh, uh, this is an interesting question. Thanks, uh, thanks. Now, you have got in hockey different uh, position players. Uh, you know, goalkeeper is there, defender is there, sure. midfielder and forwards. And all require different fitness uh, regimes. So, what do you, how do you train them differently? Mm, sure. So, yeah, good question. So, that's why that individual profiling is important. So, if you remember from the presentation where we do that start of the end in mind. So, I know what field players require, I know what the um, goalies require um, in the actual sport. Then I get that individual profile and I bring everything to the middle and I say, okay, athlete X is this far away from the group average or this far away from the international normative data. 
Um, and then I go about training, doing the training programs according not only to what they require in international hockey, but what that individual requires. Because sometimes within a forward group, so let's say I take my forwards, for example, I've got three or four really fit and strong athletes, but I've got one that's lagging behind a little bit. So I need to keep the four that are really fit, keep going, but I need to take that one or two that are maybe lagging behind and catch them up. So the prescription becomes individualized. Uh, especially the, the fitness side of things. So the energy system developed very specifically. So if you remember where I showed you the anaerobic speed reserve, the, um, the maximum aerobic speed, that all becomes very individualized because I can work at each individual specific um, intensity that I require at different times because I go about it and I just put it into an Excel and I say, okay, fifth, at 5% of anaerobic speed reserve, you're working this, 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 and this, and then we do it at the same time, but they'll cover different distances or take uh, different times to cover certain distances. Okay, yeah, that's a, that, that is the perfect answer that we can, thanks. Uh, yeah. Explain while performing drop jump, the action of ankle joint should be torsi or plantar, and why? So, uh, while performing drop jumps, the what should be dorsi or plantar? The ankle joint, yeah? Ankle joint, yes. Ankle joint. Yeah. So, yeah, so it also depends on the level of athlete. So, you'll find your vertical jumpers um, are really good at it. So, they'll be able to maintain a really rigid pre stretch. So, you'll find that they probably won't even go into a plantar or dorsi. They'll retain a neutral position. And as they hit the ground, they'll be able to produce a really good force because they are able to produce pre tension better than your unexperienced jumping athlete. What you'll find in, say for example, I take um, the girls, for example, when you first do drop jumps, as they drop down, they'll go into a more plantar type flexion. And then from there, they'll try and do a movement, which is really difficult because you're not getting a pre-stretch of that Achilles tendon. Whereas if I'm in neutral, if I'm in dorsiflexion, I'm getting a pre-stretch of the Achilles tendon now. So remember what you spoke about potentiation is that pre-stretch ability and using that in um, that, that pre-stretch to be able to use that energy from it with a concentric muscle action creates a greater force. So more experienced athletes will probably be in a more neutral position rather than a plantar or dorsi um, flexion position. And from there, they'll be able to produce those forces um, a lot better. Uh, so it depends on the level of athlete, but my prescription would be trying to maintain as neutral pre-stretch as possible or maybe a little bit into a dorsiflexion type of um, movement. Kamleji, I hope you have got your answer. Okay, next question is on uh, what is the difference between speed strength and strength speed? Okay. As so, yeah, so, yes, okay. Yeah, so speed strength and strength speed is a good one. So strength speed is the velocity is a little bit slower than what your speed strength would be because that's why the, the words become for the, the other one. Um, and then you'll see, so for example, I'm working on speed strength. I would want my velocity to be pretty high. So one meter per second or above or even faster. So it's a very light load where I'm really stimulating those very fast high threshold motor units as quickly as possible. It's focusing on how quick can I create that contraction. Strength speed, on the other hand, would be a slightly higher load with a lower velocity, where it would maybe your rate of the force development is not as fast as your speed strength, but it's not slow like speed, um, strength, pure strength, for example. Um, so there's a very small difference between it, but the recruitment of the high threshold motor units and rate of force development um, in your speed strength is a lot greater and a lot faster than what it would be for um, your strength speed, for example. Okay, I think we have gone enough. There are a lot of questions still left. Uh, <laughs> I will take this one. Does detraining affect the neuroplasticity? And if yes, then how much time it takes to rebuild? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, 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 don't, I don't think I've got a solid answer on saying how much time, but for sure, um, detraining will affect neuroplasticity because remember, we want to stimulate those neurons as much as possible. So you, for example, we take um, the people who suffer from depression, example, um, you get a shrinking of that hippocampus area of the brain, but with exercise, we get an increase in the hippocampus. How long this occurs is very, very difficult for me to say because there isn't much research on it. But what I'll say is if you stick to your general training guidelines and the detraining effects of your um, physiological system, so aerobic, your strength, and so on and so forth, so what we know is 
your aerobic system doesn't de-chain as fast as, for example, your speed system. So we need to stimulate speed a lot more frequently than we need to do with aerobic system. So that gives you a little bit of an answer on the neuroplasticity side. I mean, because speed, so sprinters, for example, need a really fast um, motor stimulus from the brain down to the muscles compared to an, a marathon runner. So they can maintain that longer. So if we're not stimulating the right system for a period of time, you will get detrained. But how long that would be from a neuroplasticity point of view is very difficult to answer. What I would say is rather stick to the detraining of the physiology and then that neuroplasticity will um, be, be, be able to be restored with it. Okay, I think we will stop here. Uh, more or less, uh, most of the important questions have been answered. And uh, now it is only my duty to thank you uh, profoundly for a very, very, uh, you know, uh, informative session. Uh, it was on a scale where we, want, where we wanted it. And uh, today's uh, lecture was meant basically for a higher uh, le understanding level. So it's, uh, it was required for our elite coaches and uh, for our coaches who are uh, specifically training our developmental athletes in the National Centers of Excellence. So thank you very much, Bain. No, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Sorry I went over time. I think I've even left stuff out, but maybe one day we can go yeah. again and go in more depth. <laughs> uh, we will break them down into different, uh, you know, different regimes. So sure. We have a much bigger perspective. Yeah. We will sure. break, down, break them down into smaller regimes and we'll bring, bring, bring specific training sessions uh, in future whenever no we have these uh, sessions again. Yeah. Thank what you. What I'll do is I will send you the link to the presentation because it's online. So if anyone wants to view it again, they're welcome to look at it. Thank you so much. Uh, please send no problem. it. And uh, once again, thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. You too. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, participants, uh, presentation was उसमें से हमारे एग्जाम में कोई भी क्वेश्चंस नहीं होंगे क्योंकि ये एक स्पेसिफिक पर्पस था इसका तो इसके लिए आप कोई भी चिंता ना करें बस आपकी नॉलेज एनहांसमेंट के लिए आज का सेशन था आप लोग के पास स्ट्रेंथ ट्रेनिंग के लिए बहुत सारी किताबें उपलब्ध हैं पढ़ने के लिए अपनी नॉलेज को बढ़ाने के लिए और बहुत सारी वेबसाइट्स भी हैं American Strength and ASCA है, Australia की Strength Training Society है, उन सब के journals लगातार articles publish करते रहते हैं, जो कि freely available भी हैं download करने के लिए, या बहुत कम खर्चा करके आप उनके members भी बन सकते हैं, और बहुत ही small contribution होता है, और बहुत सारी knowledge अगर आप gain करना चाहें, especially strength and conditioning के field में तो आप गेन कर सकते हैं और अपनी को बहुत ही ज़्यादा अच्छे एक्सपर्ट्स बना सकते हैं इसके साथ ही मैं आज का सेशन खत्म कर रहा हूँ और अब हमने स्टेंथ एंड ट्रेनिंग के ऊपर सारे लेक्चर्स खत्म कर लिए हैं कल का हमारा सेशन एक्सक्लूसिवली डोपिंग के ऊपर होगा क्योंकि डोपिंग भी एक बहुत ही जो है इम्पोर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट है और हमारे एक बहुत अच्छे डॉक्टर इसको लेंगे तो आप जरूर ज्वाइन करिए कल का सेशन जो कि डोपिंग पर होगा। थैंक यू वेरी मच। गुड इवनिंग एंड नमस्कार।